according to your LinkedIn, you're like a graphic designer, mm -hmm. uh, web designer. But interestingly, you study something like uh, entirely different, which was, uh, it says here, human anatomy, uh, physiology, and biochem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then now you're like brand and visual identity graphic designer. Like, what motivated that, like, drastic switch? Uh, frustration. Um, so I graduated in 2014. Yeah. And when I finished, I was looking for a job and I couldn't find a job anywhere. So I was you know, sort of going through the whole process of sending out emails to different corners of the world, like here in Harare, and I still couldn't get anything. Yeah. So I was opening up rejection emails and, you know, sorry, we don't have any vacancies. And I was like, oh man, like I can't keep doing this. Yeah. Uh, so to curb my frustration, I decided that I wanted to teach myself a new skill. And it just so happened that I gravitated more towards design because I feel like I was that child who used to like hand make cards and like DIY things so yeah. that creative inclination was already there so I also think it's also freak chance or maybe it's divine order I don't yeah. know what to call it because um, as I was thinking about this the first recommended video that popped up on my YouTube was a Photoshop tutorial wow. so I was like oh what is this so I just clicked into it out of interest I was like wait you're telling me <laughs> that people actually use their computers to make things like this. Yeah. So immediately I was hooked, started self-learning. Um, I eventually got a job like six months later, but I would go to my job, my day job, and come back yeah. home and be like, what can I learn today? Like, what design can I replicate Oh, so today? you got like a job in line with your, your studies, yeah, the, so the in, stuff. Yeah, so in line with, I worked in, in sports and conditioning. Uh, yeah. And so I would go and do that, and then I'll come back come home back. and be like, what's happening? And I must <laughs> tell you, at the time, I had the worst <laughs> system ever, okay? Like, I had my old university laptop, and it would make all sorts of kinds of noises that I didn't even understand. <laughs> but that is the laptop I was on, and I was learning and how to design. Doing, yeah. um, up until it died a very, you know, wow. a very, a very <laughs> appropriate to death, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's what I did. So balancing like my day job and like designing throughout the night and that sort of thing. And I eventually decided that, hey, this is what I want to do because I really fell in love with it. So fast forward, I left my job and that's what I do full time now. Yeah, so that's always a thing that uh, I find uh, a lot of people like struggle with in terms of... Um, when to take the leap, like to leave and become mm -hmm. like um, fully solo or like freelance or whatever. But the thing is, what, what were like the pointers or the indicators for you that told you that, okay, I think I'm ready to actually do this uh, full time and mm. leave my job? Yeah, okay, so I really love that question. I think that I actually w was two years too late, in my opinion. Because, first yeah. of all, I kept on telling myself that, hey, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> like, can you do this? Like, Fungi, who do you think you are? Like, just leaving a whole security blanket to pursue yeah. this new thing that you didn't even study at school. Yeah. So the major pointers for me were I started feeling stifled in my work environment. So it was an amazing space to work in because I was working with children and I absolutely loved it. Yeah. but stifled in the sense that when you're a young person and you don't see immediate or dynamic growth in your career or you don't yeah. see like progression where you feel like you've just reached the ceiling that's where i was so it sort of became a thing where yeah i loved what i was doing and i'll go to work but i'll be like what's the next step what's from next? here so that definitely was like a big push for me so I decided that I needed to put myself in a position where I became a little bit bolder and a little bit more braver. And I took the leap, not knowing what was on the other side of the... <laughs> yeah, there were of, no guarantees. Of, yeah, no guarantees at all, because I'm like, you're leaving somewhat of a consistent salary, you know, that on the 25th, yeah. it's Your coming, in. coming in. <laughs> it may not be, you know, like a lot, but, but it's, there, it's there, right? For a fact. Um, and you're leaving that, you're going to try and figure out how to like market your work, how to promote yourself, where are your clients going to come yeah. from, are they going to pay you what you ask, you know, things like this, so many things. But the major point, like I'm saying, is just the fact that 
I felt like I'd reached the ceiling at my job and I just needed a new challenge and I needed something that was going to also force me to grow yeah. as a young person. So yeah. that's what made me leave my job. And so I'll ask you this now as someone who also like kind of quit the job abruptly to mm -hmm. start this. Uh, what was the reaction like uh, in terms of like from your support systems? I would assume maybe that's like uh, immediate family. Mm -hmm. Like, were they on board or did they think, yo, Fungi suddenly turned into a rock star? <laughs> what was going on there? Into a rock star <laughs> of my days. Um, so it's, it's actually quite interesting because I think that it wasn't something that I was actively doing, obviously, yeah. uh, but I spoke about it here and there at home. Um, I'm not entirely sure if there was like a full understanding or full appreciation of what it was, yeah. but I think that the moment where it sort of clicked, and I'm grateful because I do come from a very supportive family, yeah. is when I started actually like showing them my work and I was like oh this is actually what's happening and I was also shocked in this period because like I didn't expect to get the reaction that I was getting uh just from posting my work online yeah so I showed my parents I was like this is insane <laughs> this is what I'm doing first of all but yeah. this response is out of this world because even I am genuinely like so overwhelmed and so grateful for it and then they're like wait actually this is like really intriguing work. So I was like, the moment I think that they saw what I was actually doing, yeah. it clicked that it could be something. It really could be something. So when I eventually decided that, hey, I, this is what's happening. I've decided to take this full time. They were extremely, extremely supportive. Um, and if anything, they wished me well. And they're like, we really look forward to seeing your growth and what comes out of this. So yeah. it was... It was a nice thing. Yeah, it was a very it wasn't nice thing. contentious. Yeah. No, not at all. Not <laughs> That's at all. great to hear. And then from this formative stage, uh, so obviously we talked about the, the human anatomy and, and biochem. Do you feel like uh, there are things you've taken from your studies and your work in the science field that have <laughs> come to your design work now? Uh, definitely. So when I look at design, I still... Uh, see it as some form of like problem solving yeah. and I guess my scientific background allows me to be able to apply like you know like very intricate processes to what I do so just like the methodology behind you know researching for a project you know yeah. evaluating if you know I have the right resources and that sort of thing and then sort of iterating on everything and like testing it to see if it actually works if I need to introduce something new yeah. I just feel like all of those sort of things that I used to do or things that I learned, I can still just carry them over and then I can marry the two together, yeah. which I think is quite nice as well. Yeah, it, it does sound very, I think, intentional is, is the word. I yeah, think. yeah. So that's, I mean, that's also part of my brand tagline, right? Intentional conscious calculator. Yeah, so that's uh, actually what I was going to come to is, <laughs> you've actually, I think I read this either in an interview well, from your Comic Expo's talk, I don't really remember where I heard you say, but uh, you said that uh, you design with conscious intent. Mm -hmm. So is that just exactly what you described or there's like more to it? Uh, so that's exactly what I've just described, but um, more so in the sense that uh, the intentionality comes behind the stories that I'd like to tell. Yeah. So my work is heavily influenced by African narratives and being able to I guess, cultivate and to nurture, like, positive um, Afro sentiments. Yeah. And the reason behind that is because I think for a very long time, like, there's this picture that's been painted of Africa where, you know, people may <laughs> seem like, oh, it's, it's about the struggle, yeah. you know. And the thing is, this is not to say that the African experience doesn't come with trauma and that sort of thing, but I think there's a lot more to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, so the intentionality, really, and the more so the conscious intent is to make sure that in everything that I'm doing, I'm still able to tap into different African narratives and see how I can tell them in a very intriguing way, yeah. but still make sure that we are revering them, right? And we're telling them with the grace and the beauty that they deserve. Yeah, so that's a very interesting thing because um, from, from my work in the media, um, from what I've seen, and, and this is not like matter of fact, but just my experience mm -hmm. is, you tend to find, uh, especially younger Africans, 
it takes them a lot to come around to actually uh, value our own culture and stuff like that. H have you always been like that or was this something that's almost been awakened uh, with time? How, how did you come to that? Like, come through with these questions. I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> um, so I can definitely and very honestly say that I haven't always been like this. Yeah. Because just like you've expressed, I feel like a big part of who I am and how I identify in terms of yeah. culture was very shielded. Um, yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with the schools that we go to, the things that we're the taught. The media we consume. Exactly. All of these things. Uh, so I know even in school, like you get in trouble for speaking in Shana at break time. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? What does that mean? <laughs> what does that actually mean when I am a yeah. Shana girl, right? <laughs> and that is my native tongue. Yeah. I should be able to express myself in that way, especially yeah. if I'm talking to my peers. It's another thing when I'm in the classroom, right? And yeah, I acknowledge exactly. that maybe not everyone may understand but if I'm talking to you, I should be able to express myself in a way yeah. that feels most comfortable for me. Yeah. So just based off of that alone, I feel like a lot of, you know, like what could have been in terms of like really like stepping into who I am as a Zimbabwean Shona slash Ndebele woman, yeah. like was really just suppressed. Yeah. So what really like struck or what really like helped me to come into this phase is that like when I started designing I was doing everything and anything you could have asked me the most random thing to be like can you design a flyer for my six-year-old uh I don't know pit bull or something and I'll be like yeah yeah <laughs> like let's do that of course but it became so draining in the sense that you just end up doing work right and it's not anything that really inspires you or motivates you so the thing that really like just caused a shift is that I came across a book. The book is called African Alphabets yeah. by Prof. Saki Mafundigwa, who is a well-known Zimbabwean graphic designer. He started the first design school here in, in Harare. And this book is amazing because it just talks about, or it has pictorials of uh, different like writing systems within Africa. Yeah. So I was just like, this is mad. Because <laughs> what? Does this exist? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, so like my mind was literally blown. How because do you I was not like, learn about these I things? I was like, what is this? And why are we not learning about it in school? And, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I just started like, you know, questioning a little bit more. And then I started doing a little bit more research. And I was like, you know what? When it comes to Afri uh, African expression, we see it in film, in music, uh, in photography. Uh, but we never really see it in brand design. Yeah, we never really see it in web design. We never really see it in UI, UX design and product design, whatever the case is. So I definitely felt like there was a gap. So that moment, which is probably, um, so I've been designing for seven years. That moment yeah. was probably um, around mid-2018. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? We are switching up shift. the game right now. <laughs> like we need to take everything down like i took down all my instagram posts i took down all my tweets because i was like this is it yeah and it's something that also made me feel alive because i felt like for the first time i was going to start creating with purpose yeah. as opposed to just doing work to get paid getting paid for um <laughs> yeah so that's that's definitely like sort of like the the progression that i went through um but yeah yeah that's 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 amazing and in line with that uh i also read in another interview that you've been uh working on designing uh type so i'm i'm, I'm gonna bet that uh most of the people <laughs> watching this won't know what that means mm -hmm. but yeah one what does that mean and how how has that been going for you so far uh so it's definitely a learning curve for sure uh it's something that i'm still working on um because you think you're there, but you're not there. <laughs> and also because as creators, we're well, worse critics, you're like, no, 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 I need to do a little bit more. Yeah. Like, it just needs to be right. Uh, so that has been a very interesting journey. And for those who are watching who may not uh, fully comprehend what that means, basically, it's the process of learning how to design a font. So if you have your alphabet, your ABCs and yeah. that sort of thing, right, there are different arrangements of these characters that people design so that they can represent a language um, more specifically. Yeah. So if you look at maybe how Mandarin is written, or if you look at how, again, these African writing systems that I was talking about, if yeah. you look at how Shona is written, 
right? So we definitely follow a Latin alphabet. So in Shona, you'll still get your I, A, E, O, O and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, or in English. But that's basically what it is. So I am starting out by learning how to design a Latin-based um, typeface, so yeah. which just has your regular A to Z. Uh, but with time, hopefully, um, you know, the intention is to at least tap into what my peers are doing, where they're yeah. actually trying to revive lost languages through, through type. So it yeah. becomes more specific, and you have more specific characters that actually form the sounds of those languages as opposed to just having Letters. your regular Latin alphabet. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's cool stuff. Yeah. That, that sounds, <laughs> one, I think that sounds challenging, um, but that also sounds like, like really ambitious. Like, how do you get to think of these things? <laughs> like, this is the next thing that I'm going to work on. Like, what's, is that like, do you have a process or it's, it's sometimes it's just inspiration? Uh, so I think it's definitely um, exposure. Exposure yeah. in the sense that you do tap into what you, your peers may be doing in the industry and that sort of thing, and you just want to experiment and see how far you can take it as well. Yeah. And the other thing is just pure interest, because I think that the thing that we need more as African creators is documentation, yeah. right? So we need to be able to have archives of so many of these things that are representative of African culture that we can't necessarily like easily access. Yeah. So Google is there, right? You can Google some stuff, <laughs> great. But you may not get in depth and you may not get exactly what it yeah. is and what it represents and like the rich culture and like the the heritage, the storytelling behind it. Yeah. So if more and more and more of us, right, regardless of what creative this. discipline you're in, so even in media, if we're able to capture these moments, yeah. if we're able to go out and actually see what's happening in the world, or I guess on the continent, yeah. to be more specific, it means that we are starting to sort of do the work for the next generation yeah. where they'll have something that they can reference and be like oh yeah, yeah no this is how this is supposed to sound that's how that looks oh if you go to this part of zimbabwe this is how people do things right there's a whole process of document of documenting this so whether it's going to be you know through film whether it's going to be through writing whether it's going to be through visuals you know through art whatever the case is we need more and more of that mm -hmm. so i think if anything that's the prompt for me to be like hey how far can you keep pushing the boundary? Like, yeah. what can we explore today? What can we experiment with today? Yeah. Uh, so that really is the motivation behind most of these things. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think what you said there is, like, um, it aligns us weirdly in that, like you said, uh, even, even as media, that's what we're trying to do as well, is, like, mm -hmm. capture these moments and times that we anticipate will mean something very significant for for future generations and mm -hmm. so yeah that's it's just it's very inspiring as well seeing you guys work on these grand but also like very um i don't want to say niche but <laughs> very like intentional problems that you're trying to solve it, mm -hmm. it's, it's very inspiring so another thing that you've you've talked about uh in your work because what you do is uh brand and visual identity design work right um, in this work, you've said you're, you're like passionate about uh, sustainable packaging. Um, why? And you know, what are some of these things that you've that you've uh, seen or done in this space? You know, that align with that uh, sustainable packaging. Um, so first of all, I definitely want to do more. So yeah. I just want to say that as a premise. Um, you know, from my lips to God's ears, I'll have a packaging plant in Zimbabwe <laughs> that will be fully sustainable and will cater to African brands across the continent. Yeah. But what I've been doing is that, especially because I do do a lot of packaging design, I do at least prompt my clients to make sure that we're going the sustainable route. Yeah. Right. And I guess this comes just from wanting to make sure that we leave the 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 earth a, bit, a better place there's just so much that's it. happening <laughs> yeah. and you know we can all play our little part in making sure that we at least take care of it because it takes care of us yeah um so i do prompt them to you know look towards suppliers who use biodegradable material um you know towards suppliers who 
at least are very conscious of of what goes into their process and everything like that because it's not just the material at the end but it's how everything is done yeah. so that's how i've been doing it um yeah. within you know my current capacity yeah uh but yeah it's it's definitely something that i'm passionate about and like i said you know you God know willing. one day <laughs> is one day <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, yeah. a full-fledged packaging plant that caters for for from design to shelf. So we'll yeah. see how that goes. So I think one of the common conceptions, I won't call it a misconception because that's actually what I'm going to ask you, is one of the common uh, thoughts around stuff like sustainability is uh, it's expensive. One, is that true? And if yes, how do you then like navigate that with like a company who you're designing for? Is it like... Not only are you paying me to design, now I'm pushing you maybe to like incur an extra cost. Yeah. If true, you know. Yeah. Like, so what, what, is, what is that like? It is a little bit more expensive. Uh, that's for sure. It's going to cost you a couple of cents more. Yeah. And those cents are going to add up. Um, <laughs> but hey, I just kind of do it regardless. I'm like, yeah. hey, so I was wondering, like, since we're working on this, <laughs> what do you think of, you know, and... I'm grateful because I think most of the time when I have suggested it, they have yeah. been open to it. So um, it's it's a good thing when you definitely have the budget for it. But then if not, then, hey, um, no harm done, I think, because we have to be able to do what we can. But if there's room for us to actually go that route, then I'm definitely going to suggest it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That's, yeah. Because I, I just thought usually when people start talking about green yeah no green is expensive actually and i think that there needs to be a shift towards making it more you know like economically yeah. fiscal because yeah it is it is a little bit more just pricey. to add that incentive yeah 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 and then so for most of your your career you've uh, worked as an individual am i right about that yes what are some of the cha the challenges you face as a, a, a solopreneur, for like lack of a better term? Um, yeah, uh, so I think that, first of all, being a solopreneur is, is fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> because at least I'm in control of my time. You know, I can plan other things outside of work and know that I can still do those things because I hold myself to my own targets. Yeah. But it can be overwhelming because you have to wear all the hats, right? Yeah. So I am admin, <laughs> I am content Finance. creation, social media manager, <laughs> accountant, yeah. uh, you know, brand strategist. I'm the designer. Like, I'm the one who's going to be at the end of emails. Like, it's, it's everything. It's a um, but I think that for where I am and for how long I've been doing it, like, I wouldn't trade it for anything else yeah. uh, because I do prefer that as as my working model yeah. maybe down the line in the future i could or i have been thinking of then you know um bringing on some design interns and that sort of thing but i think for now like i'm very happy being mm. a solo yeah. Yeah. so yeah great to hear i mean if it works if it's what did they say if it's not broken don't fix yeah, it yeah if it's not yeah. broken don't yeah. fix it <laughs> but i mean also you know some of the challenges of being a solopreneur is that you People say, oh, you know, I want to leave my nine to five, you know, so that I can have more time. But you leave your nine to five and you're working. It's 24 7. <laughs> like you're on. Okay. Like you're working. Yeah. Uh, and there's, <laughs> and what people don't talk about a lot is that, like, it comes with, like, entrepreneurial anxiety, right? Where you're like, if I'm not working, <laughs> I'm not making money. Yeah. Right, yeah. and there's no one who's going to who's pay me cover a salary that gap. <laughs> and cover that gap. So you need to get your act together and work. But then that also can be detrimental because then you find yourself working yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, so you have to then become very intentional again about making sure that you have a healthy work-life balance, yeah. but you can still make you know enough money so that you can, you can sustain yourself and that sort of yeah. thing. So. Yeah, pros and cons, but I am very happy being a solopreneur. Yeah, and then within your work, uh, what is like the most the most joyous aspect of, of being a designer? Ah, oh, shucks. I think just the fact that you have a blank canvas. Like you just start with nothing 
Yeah. And all of, not all of a sudden, but you know, <laughs> but with As time, you, you know, with process and iterations, you're like, oh man, where I started it was a little bit ugly, but now it's actually quite pretty. Yeah. So I think that's definitely one of the joys that I get where you just, every single time you just start with a blank canvas and, and it's just being able to express different ideas, like explore different, you know, directions and coming up with like this final outcome where you're like one definitely like achieved uh solving the creative uh problem yeah but it's also very cool to look at and you're like oh man i kind of did that that's cool <laughs> uh so that's definitely one yeah. of the things that brings me joy for yeah. sure yeah i think i agree with that i think when you're creative um the ability to see that process from that ugly deception mm -hmm. to like something that you have made and it, it looks really nice at the end. It, yeah, it, it does something for your confidence. It, yeah, it does very... for sure. <laughs> and when it's ugly, it's ugly. Don't be fooled. <laughs> like you'll stare at it for like five hours and yeah. be like, huh, okay, I'm taking a nap. You take a nap, you wake up, you're like, okay, we're deleting everything. Yeah, we're starting all yeah, over again. Yeah. But I think like you're saying, just that process of being able to really like, you know, like, take things, add things, see what works, see what yeah. doesn't work. And then eventually at the end, seeing the final product and just being so proud of the work that you've put in yeah. like, goes a yeah. long way for sure. It's definitely made me more appreciative of um, humble beginnings, <laughs> mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Um, but then there's something else you've, you've mentioned. Um, man, I sound like a stalker. You, know? <laughs> you mentioned this, you mentioned this, but yeah. <laughs> You, you've talked about um, the decolonization of African design and design education, mm -hmm. right? Um, what does this mean and how does it help us as Africans in, in your view? Uh, so I guess when you look at, and I'll talk about it from like a graphic design perspective. Yeah. Like when you look at it, like a lot of the education around that is very Western. Right, so most of the books, they're Western. Yeah. Uh, design principles, fundamentals, they're all Western concepts. Yeah. Um, and because of that, you find that uh, maybe a lot of us, when you do start learning graphic design, right, it has that kind of influence. I know a lot of my earlier work, like I was trying to make it like minimal, yeah. you know, and, you know, <laughs> just, just put a little bit in there. Because that's what we're exposed yeah, to when we're learning, when you're going through these Photoshop tutorials, when you're yeah. on YouTube and that yeah. sort of thing. So when we're talking about like decolonization of that, of design education specifically, yeah. is to say, hey, we need to be able to break it apart in such a way that we express design not in the way that it has been termed uh, that it should look, but in the way that it can look. Because context now matters. Yeah. If I am a designer here in Narada, Zimbabwe, my context, right, my global context, my historical context yeah. is different to a designer in the UK, yeah. a designer in Germany. So they're going to design according to what they see every single day. And I, we should be able to do the same thing as well as African designers. Yeah. So that means that the influence behind my work, you know, the final output, what you actually see has to carry a bit of what I am exposed to. Yeah. So that becomes very important because it adds to the diversity of storytelling, first of all. But then it also like perpetuates, perpetuates, <laughs> you need to edit that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, you know, this, this sort of um, uh, narrative where we see more and more and more and more of our stories being told in the light that they deserve to be told. Yeah. So I think that is very important because even now, if we look at the broader context, right, um, there are 54 countries in Africa, yeah. right? Yeah. That means that even within that, there are 54 different stories that yeah. could be told, right? Yeah. Loosely. Yeah. But if we go in depth, their tribe, their clan, <laughs> you know, their... Down to oh, the individual. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so which means that those, that 54, it triples, yeah. quadruples, yeah. right? So there are more and more and more and more stories that we can tell, which is why decolonization becomes very important because we need more of that out there. Yeah. Uh, so essentially that is what that means. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think we align in a lot of ways. <laughs> so that's always an interesting thing. And then um, 
you've also mentioned that you know there's been a shift uh, from the external impositions of the colonial era to like a deeper acknowledgement and overall curiosity of Africa traditional craft and craftsmanship and how to draw like inspiration from all of that. Um, and this is the thing I've seen in, I think where I've seen it the most is in fashion. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that then interests me is like, why now? Why do you think this is happening now? Because you're in graphic design mm -hmm. and I'm sure because you're in graphic design, you also see other Africans doing the same thing. This, yeah. The way I say it, I'm seeing people in fashion, people in media do these things. Why do you think it's happening now? Um, do you know, like, that is a very interesting question. I think that it's probably happening now because the time is now where people like myself, people like yourself are coming yeah. into the realization that, hey, we've been lied to this whole time, <laughs> right? We've yeah. been sort of eating up the story that is not ours and people have been forging our story and coming up with their own interpretations of things. Yeah. So I don't know if it's to say that we've become more woke. I don't know if it's to say it's the advent of social media where there's a lot more exposure and you yeah. see a lot more stories and we're a little bit more like, what? <laughs> that, what is that? that should be done. <laughs> like, who sounds like that? Like, who looks like that? Yeah, you know, things yeah. like that. So just coming into that, I think it's... I can't give you a specific answer to say why yeah. it's happening right now. I'm just grateful yeah. it's happening right now. That's true. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> and then, in, in all of this, right, um, we've talked about all these things, and, and, and that's great. Uh, but there's always a question I love to, to bounce off people uh, because I am only one man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, who who do you think I would I should talk to after this? Who should, who should I look for? Maybe one or two people that you would love. Oh, just just two? Like yeah. I'll give you a whole list of people <laughs> that you need to talk to. Even <laughs> even let's, as many as you can mention because uh, the the fantastic thing about that is even if I'm not the one talking to them, mm -hmm. all these other people who who watch and listen to this mm -hmm. also get to like look for these people and they're exposed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So um. Definitely like uh, Zimbabwean peers in design who are also doing the same work that I am, but yeah. our contexts are very different. Yeah. Tapiwa Sebastian Garikai, amazing type designer. Yeah. Uh, Taurai Valerie Mtake, also an amazing designer. Osmond Chuma, amazing designer. Yeah. Uh, Bainham Gorodema. Amazing. I, I think I've come across his stuff from yeah. all the people you've mentioned. And he I just recently I... designed like a typeface called Neander. He posted it on Instagram yesterday and yeah. stunning. Um, <laughs> who else? So I think off the top of my head, that's who I can come up with. Yeah, but yeah. they are definitely doing amazing, amazing exploits when it comes to elevating African narratives in their own way. And I yeah. think that you should definitely have a conversation with them. That's sensational. Uh, thanks so much for, for coming through, Fungi. Uh, I, so I first saw you speak uh, in last year, last year Comics Post. Yes. And it felt like holding a mirror up <laughs> <laughs> in that a lot of the things you were saying about, you know, recapturing our own storytelling, um, shifting the narrative of how African stories are told, uh, mm -hmm. Is, is extremely important to me. And, and ever since then, as, as odd as that sounds, I've had this episode planned since then, and that should have been, I think, late November. Yeah, which is, <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> I've just been, you know, researching, just looking into how we can craft uh, an episode together. And so I'm, I'm really thankful that, you know, you've, uh, you've come on and given us a, a chance to, to, to tell your story as well. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy to be here. And yeah. I know that someone will probably say I sound like a broken record, but <laughs> I will die on this hill. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I will keep spreading this message and you know, just the more we're able to get it out there and the more we're able to actually just step into our own and realise that being African has all the source. Yeah, that is the source. Like, <laughs> the, the boldness, the vibrancy, the energy, you're not going to get it anywhere else. Yeah, and we just yeah, need more yeah, and more of yeah. that out there. And, and it's also like a, a cliche, a stereotype, but you really see a lot of, um, a lot of culture is bitten off us. Like, a lot of music, a lot of uh, yeah, fashion, you yeah. know, just a lot of these, the things that are almost like... <laughs> 
correlated to swag are really like uh, bitten off of our cultures yeah. and then unfortunately uh, the people who are on the continent we are almost like the people who then don't really like see it like that we're the people who don't really like love it for what it is yeah so, yeah there's Which is, there's a lot of work to do yeah there is a lot of work to do they don't yeah. they don't call africa the motherland for for nothing yeah, right this yeah. is where a lot of things were born so we need to make sure that we nurture them yeah right. so once again thank you so much fungi all the best in your design work uh, that typeface now i'm gonna be on your case like yo what's happening as much as i know like creators hate that uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just going to do that just to irritate you once in a while. No, like, please hold me accountable so we, we actually get the work done. <laughs> Where we at? And then, God willing, um, we, can, we can have another conversation once you've done that. Uh, maybe we can have another conversation with the sustainable uh, packaging plan. You know, yeah. God willing, all these things. The stars align and, and these are things that we, or that you actually actualize. Yeah. yeah. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much.